More job losses at Tata Steel beg a string of inevitable questions tonight. Can the industry now be saved? Should it be? And if so, why is the government sitting on its hands? Also on News at 10 tonight. Learn English or go home, says David Cameron. We are home, say the immigrants we've spoken to, but we should have learnt English. You can't ban Donald Trump for being stupid, say MPs, though some admit they're tempted. And I was made in Dagenham, says Idris Elba, but I could only make it in film and TV by leaving Britain. Made in Hackney, made in Newham, made in Dagenham, but above all, I was made in my mind. This is ITV News at 10 with Tom Bradby. Good evening. Once in a while, you do encounter a statistic that does seem to cut straight to the heart of an issue. Did you know, for example, that a ton of Chinese steel is now actually cheaper than a ton of Chinese cabbages? It seems absurd. Arguably, it is. But how are British steelmakers supposed to compete with that? Well, the obvious truth is they can't. So once again today, we saw the consequences in Britain's steel industry, most notably in the South Wales town of Port Talbot. Nearly 650 jobs will go there, another 400 more in Tata Steel as a whole. Workers are worried that the whole Port Talbot operation will end up closing unless the government does something to protect it from the fallout of cheap Chinese steel. And on Minister's record to date, they probably shouldn't hold their breath. Night has brought to an end another dark day for Britain's steel industry. 4,000 families at Port Talbot now waiting to see if their livelihoods will go when 637 jobs are lost. 400 others will be let go at Glanwern, Corby and Hartlepool in the hope that some layoffs may save the industry. We've been losing significant amounts of money and I think it's a prudent and, and vital action that we actually take. Port Talbot is the UK's biggest steelworks and that significant financial loss is thought to be a million pounds a week. My grandfather worked there, my father worked there, I work here and my son works here. Graham Rowland's family, like many others, must now contemplate an end to the generational ties with the industry. Morale is, is very low at the minute. Uh, it doesn't stop people trying their best uh, to get the product out. Uh, uh, it, it, it's been very difficult for, for everybody. I think we've, we've just been waiting, really, for this announcement. The threat to the UK steel industry comes from many fronts. European steel has seen a sharp drop in prices caused by a flood of cheap steel, mainly from China. Five years ago, a tonne cost around £490. By the end of last year, it was closer to 240 High energy bills make production expensive here. £130 million a year is paid to meet climate change rules. And business rates for UK steel companies can be up to 10 times that of France or Germany. Unions now want direct government action. We should start actually turning these Chinese boats around and tell them, sorry, we're not going to accept any more dumping, because it is subsidised without a shadow of a doubt. I think without that, it will be difficult to see a future for UK steel industry in general. For more than a century, steel has offered this area an industry, an identity and an income, with many of the wages earned here being spent in the local community. It's estimated that when one job is lost in a place like this, Four others are at risk. That is really desperate news in an area that already has an unemployment rate higher than the national average. Keith Evans's family have been making pies for a century, their business growing and diminishing with the steelworks. It's just going to have an effect on us all again. Your business suffered the last time, did it? Yeah. And it looks like it'll suffer again. When this plant opened, it was a source of pride and hope. The pride remains, but the hope is drifting away. Emma Murphy, News at 10, Port Talbot. Well, since last summer, almost 5,000 steel jobs have been lost in Britain. As Emma was explaining there, there are many factors, of course, but the main one is that Chinese factories are still churning out huge amounts of steel, much of which it no longer needs. 
Steel is the material that has made China's industrial revolution possible. It's the spine of every skyscraper. In the last 30 years, entire cities have risen from the ground here. But the economy is slowing and China's appetite for steel has waned. Global demand has fallen, but China's factories are producing steel in record quantities. The market is awash and prices have collapsed. The impact is being felt in South Wales. For now, China stands tall, but there are some who believe that here too, production and jobs will have to be cut. The whole thing is unsustainable. Uh, you look at the prices they're getting and you look at the, what kind of uh, input uh, the steel can make apart from urbanization. Um, the manufacturing is now geared uh, towards more innovation, uh, more kind of high quality manufacturing, and that doesn't necessarily depend on steel. The scale of China's steel industry is awesome. It employs three and a half million people. Britain's steel industry employs just 25,000. Fifteen years ago, China produced one-sixth of the world's steel. Today, it produces half. Last year, China exported a record 107 million tonnes of steel. British producers estimate that China sold it at an average loss of £24 a tonne. This rolling mill is privately owned, but the bulk of China's steel industry is actually owned by the government. Now, in recent months, steel producers in China have started to report some pretty hefty losses. But when your largest shareholder is the government, you're not in any danger of going out of business. The European Commission could tax or ban Chinese imports if it decides Beijing really is selling steel at a loss. Their investigation is ongoing, just as China's economy seems to be losing its shine. Tomorrow's growth figures are expected to show another slowdown. This country's ability to call the shots may be coming to an end. Joel Hills, News at 10 in Hong Kong. Well, our political editor Robert Peston is here. Robert, we've heard a lot of talk, not least from the yeah. Chancellor this year, about how worried we should be about China. So how worried should we be about China? Well, a lot more worried than the official figures from China would make most ordinary people think we should be. Why do I say that? Well, we can't trust those figures. And let's just go back to the fundamentals of, of China. For 30 years, growing at an astonishing rate of 10% a year, that's about three times the rate we were growing, and at the time of the Great Crash, started to slow down. They will claim that the growth rate is just under 7%. Very few serious economists believe that that is the real rate, probably nearer 4 or 5. It could be lower still. Now, when China is the world's second biggest economy, that kind of slowdown really matters to all of us. And, and what we've all got to focus on is that the way that they've been generating growth since the great crash of 2008 has been fundamentally, seriously unsustainable. When we hit the buffers, they kept growing by going on the mother of all investing and lending sprees. And they accumulated debt, equivalent to about 100% of their GDP, their national income, since then. Now, that is a rate of lending and borrowing faster than the rate of lending and borrowing that caused our crash. So we are, we should all be pretty worried about this. And we should be worried. Obviously, ministers are going to come yeah. under pressure to help steal. Should they be? Could they do more? Look, ministers have done what they can in terms of removing some of the costs from steel producers of paying for green energy. But you've got to put this into the context of what's been happening to our manufacturing industry in general. George Osborne, senior ministers, talked in 2010 about the need for the march of the makers. Manufacturing as a whole has continued to shrink since then. There is a big underlying story here, two underlying stories. We are becoming more dependent on services and the world, because of China, is slowing down not good for us. OK, Robert, uh, we'll come back to it. I'm fairly sure, but thank you very much uh, indeed. Now, many people would probably think it is fair to link, as the Prime Minister did today, a failure to learn English with a failure to fit in with everyday British life. He had thousands of Muslim women in mind. He says new arrivals must be able to speak the language or face being sent back to where they came from. In Batley, as well as English, you're likely to hear plenty of Urdu, as well as Gujarati. 
often spoken by people who arrived decades ago. Razia has been here for 30 years, her friend Zabunisa for 58 years and Zuleika for 45 years. They would have liked to take English classes, but as young mothers never found the time. In future, David Cameron says things will be different, controversially suggesting on a visit to Leeds that newcomers who refuse to learn English could be deported. There are also obligations that we should put on people who come to our country, and chief amongst them should be obligations to learn English, because then you can integrate, you can take advantage of the opportunities here, and you can help us to build the strong country that we want. The Prime Minister says 190,000 Muslim women don't speak enough English to integrate. 40,000 of them speak none at all. He's pledging to spend £20 million on English lessons for women who come here to marry. But they'll be tested after two and a half years and failure could mean deportation. Few here object to the idea of extending English classes to those who struggle to master the language. But singling out Muslim women does worry some, while others say the threat of sending people home is simply a non-starter. What do you make of the suggestion that people like yourself who don't learn English should actually be sent back home? These women are British. The language test would only be for new arrivals. But would it really help defeat extremists? One former police superintendent thinks not. We have conflated extremism and radicalisation with learning English. Now, I work with some of the families that, who, who unfortunately their children have gone to Syria. Uh, the families speak English. David Cameron's critics fear singling out Muslim women may actually harm rather than help community relations. Libby Vina, News at 10, Batley in West Yorkshire. Well, there was, according to court evidence today, a reminder of that ongoing threat of terrorism, which is part of Mr Cameron's concern over lack of integration. The Old Bailey was told how four men in their 20s planned to kill soldiers, police officers and members of the public in drive-by shootings inspired by so-called Islamic State. Their intended targets, apparently, a police station and a territorial army barracks. They arrived at the Old Bailey to face trial, accused of plotting to assassinate someone on the streets of the capital. It's claimed Tarek Hassani, Sahib Majid, Niall Hamlet and a fourth man, Nathan Cuffey, were planning to execute a policeman or a soldier or even a member of the public in a drive-by shooting. The court heard the British men were inspired by the so-called Islamic State and say the prosecution, if the plot had been allowed to run its course, it would have resulted in a terrorist murder or murders on the streets of London, according to the warped ideology of the defendants. Medical student Tarek Hassani, nicknamed the surgeon, had been studying abroad in Sudan, but is said to be a central figure in the plot. It's claimed he used his iPad to research potential targets and that this Army Reserve Centre in West London was one of them. The prosecution say that amounted to hostile reconnaissance and that even when the other men were arrested, he still intended to go ahead as a lone wolf terrorist. When the police raided the home of one of the suspects in northwest London, a pistol, together with seven rounds of ammunition and a silencer, were thrown from his bedroom window. Proof, say the prosecution, they were intending to kill. They all deny conspiring to murder and preparing acts of terrorism. Their trial is expected to last the next three months. Rebecca Barry, News at 10. One of Donald Trump's solutions to the threat of terrorism in the United States was that controversial plan to ban Muslims from entering the country. This evening, MPs argued over whether to give Mr Trump a taste of his own medicine. Half a million Britons have signed a petition to ban him from coming here. 
Many MPs agreed with that, but others thought it would play into his hands. In an outbreak of not very parliamentary language, one even called him a wazak. Sometimes American politics just seems a bit bigger, brighter and more brash than ours. But Donald J. Trump still seems to take things to another level completely. President Donald Trump knows how to make America great. Do now the showbiz may great, but it's the politics which has infuriated British voters. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on. Those comments provoked more than half a million people to sign a parliamentary petition calling for Mr. Trump to be banned from Britain. So today that in turn was debated by MPs, some of whom thought him dangerous enough to be worth banning. Uh, I don't think Donald Trump should be allowed within a thousand miles of our shore because he would embolden the EDL on the one hand uh, and fuel the flames of terrorism on the other hand. His words are not comical. His words are not funny. His words are poisonous. But others thought he should come and meet their constituents. They may well tell him that he is a wazak for uh, dealing with this issue in this way. I've heard of a number of um, cases where people have been excluded for incitement and for hatred. I've never heard of one for stupidity. And I'm not sure that we should be starting now. Trump himself, appearing in Virginia today, ignored the whole thing. He does like to come here, enjoying Scottish golf courses so much he bought two. At the Trump International Golf Links, his representatives spoke up for him. It's completely absurd that the UK Parliament is wasting valuable time debating a matter that was raised in America about American borders during an American presidential campaign. It's ridiculous. And there is another petition on the go calling for Mr Trump to be allowed into this country. Although today, Commons officials removed 30,000 signatures from that, suspecting them to be fraudulent. In any event, Mr Trump will be able to come here. The Home Office doesn't think him worth banning. Carl Dinan, News at 10, Westminster. Not quite sure what to make of that. Now, it seems the race is on to make up for lost trading time with Iran now that sanctions have been lifted. Deals are being done in double quick time. In the past decade, the UK's trade with Iran has fallen from £800 million to £100 million. America's, on the other hand, has actually risen from £9 million to £220 million, thanks to farming and pharmaceutical products which weren't included in the ban. It is, in every sense, a new dawn for Iranians. The first day of what their government describes as a golden page in their modern history. And since yesterday, all the papers, whether those supporting the religiously conservative hardliners or the reformists, have been dominated by one headline. The end of a decade of sanctions. (laughs) Mohammed Safari said, we're happy. It feels like we're free now. We're out of the cage and can do whatever we want. It's a sentiment that captures the genuine sense of optimism, especially amongst young Iranians in a country that's been internationally isolated for so long. Jack Straw was foreign secretary when the very first attempts at a new diplomacy with Tehran was begun. One of the first senior British ministers to visit the Iranian capital, he continues to visit the country. This will be seen by historians uh, as a profound moment in which Iran comes in from the cold. And the sanctions are the tightest and most effective sanctions ever imposed against another country. And this is not a tiny country, this is 80 million people, middle income. So it's had a deep trauma upon Iranian society. But it's the vast potential of this country that's already leading Western politicians to beat a path to Tehran. This is the Tehran Stock Exchange. When I visited it at the end of last year, it was establishing links with the London Stock Exchange. Iran has vast natural resources and a highly educated population, with a national literacy rate of 98% and 5 million university students, half of which are women. Everyone is waiting just for the (laughs) sanctions off and uh, and the most important one is the um, sanction of the bank. Leading British businessmen say many major UK companies are keen to start doing business as quickly as possible. 
from our point of view, we want obviously uh, our clients want to be able to trade with uh, with Iran as effectively as possible and as effectively as other countries in Europe and as effectively as other countries in Europe have been doing before sanctions were listed. In many ways, a Western invasion of Iran has begun, not by businessmen, but tourists. Hardly surprising, given this country's remarkable wealth of historical and archaeological treasures. Western visitors to Iran has grown by 80% in the last two years, with more international flights and hotels opening up. But the real success of Iran's nuclear deal with world powers will depend on how much the lifting of sanctions changes the lives of ordinary Iranians, who've been affected by them far more than the regime. Well, Raggy is here. Raggy, this, is, this really is a fascinating story, because apart from anything else, we've reported a lot on the dangers of Egypt and holidaymakers nervous. Of course, Iran is stable, and you're very unlikely to face Islamic State-inspired terrorism there, aren't you? No, that's very true, and correspondingly, you've seen a huge rise, not just in the numbers of Western visitors to Iran, but also the hotels by Western companies that are opening up, the flights that international carriers from Europe in particular are going to take uh, visitors there. You can now, 110 countries can pick up visas on entry. But beyond tourism, I think what they're really after is investors and businessmen coming to the country. And do you think we're going to see a major business opportunity opening up? We're going to see a lot of British businessmen getting on planes? I think we are. And I'm, you know, they wouldn't like me to say so, but I've spotted a few of them in Tehran make it, laying the groundwork yeah. before sanctions were actually lifted. But everything from construction, yeah. oil and gas, communications, telecommunications. This is a country of 80 million people, the size of Germany, with a highly educated and entrepreneurial uh, middle class ready for business and an economy that needs modernising. Um, and um, I think, yeah, you'll start start to see a lot of British businessmen as quickly as possible there. OK, right. thank you very much yeah, indeed. Now, we've reported plenty of times in the past few months the corruption investigations going on in world football and athletics. Before that, cricket. Now it seems it's the turn of tennis. The men's world number one, Novak Djokovic, has echoed claims of match-fixing by saying he was offered money ten years ago to throw a game. So is there any sport that adults or children can put their trust in? Long before he became the world's best, James as he started life on the pro circuit, Novak Djokovic admits he was targeted. Gambling syndicates were willing to pay nearly £150,000 to the right player to intentionally lose a match. I was not approached directly. Uh, I was approached through, well, I mean me personally, through... through uh, uh, people that were working with me at that time, um, that were in my team, um, and, and of course we, <laughs> we we threw it away right away. I mean, it didn't even get to me. Today, Roger Federer even called for those suspected to be named, as the allegations dominated the first day of the first Grand Slam of the year. The initial report in 2008 recommended 28 players warranted further investigation. 16 of those are or have been ranked in the top 50, and eight were due to play at the Australian Open starting this week. Of the matches under suspicion, three were at Wimbledon. The sport itself was quick today to deny it's been sitting on any evidence. The Tennis Integrity Unit uh, and the Tennis Authorities uh, absolutely reject any suggestion um, that evidence of match fixing has been suppressed for any reason uh, or isn't being thoroughly investigated. Seven days a week with up to 50 in play. Marks. The vast amount of money gambled on tennis and the ease of placing any number of bets online are just two of many reasons why the sport is vulnerable, according to the man who led the original investigation. All round, it's a sport that has the potential for people to cheat. It's got the volume of money, it's one-on-one, -on -one, and there are going to be players that are not earning a lot of money. So it's a, it's a high-risk sport in that fact. So tonight, fans of another sport can be forgiven for questioning some of what they are paying to see. It's up to those who run the game to reassure them that whatever the level of deception, they're doing everything in their powers to stop it. Steve Scott, News at 10.
representation of ethnic minorities on television is something broadcasters insist they take very seriously. But in many programmes, the diversity of the British population is not matched on screen or, for that matter, behind the scenes. The star of the crime drama, Luther, and many other things besides, Idris Elba has been putting the case to MPs this afternoon. Just over 10 years ago, in 2004, black, Asian and ethnic minority workers made up 6.8% of the TV industry. Around 3,300 were employed in television. Two years later, that number peaked at 5,500, or almost 10% of the industry. But since then, the numbers have been falling. The figure is now 7.5% of the TV industry as a whole, despite the fact that nearly 13% of Britain as a whole are non-white. Walking onto the Westminster stage, celebrated actor Idris Elba got a rapturous reception. Wow. <laughs> but he wanted to talk about the lack of opportunity in Britain for black actors, which meant he'd struggled to be cast as a star. A white character, a white male, was always called a Caucasian, or a man with a twinkle in his eyes. Now, my eyes may be dark, but they definitely twinkle. <laughs> And I was like, I want to play the guy with the twinkle in his eyes. So I got to a certain point in my career where I saw the glass ceiling. I was so close to it, I was going to hit my forehead on it. Are you DCI Luther? Yeah. Known as the troubled detective Luther, he only got his start in drama thanks to a grant from the Prince's Trust. And he had to go to the USA to get his big break in The Wire. Femi Ogan set up the first black acting school in the UK to address the lack of opportunity. What I've seen, we all need to run. One of his protégés, John Boyega, takes a lead role in the new Star Wars film. But he is still a relatively rare success story. For performance by an actor in a supporting role, the nominees are... There's been an outcry about the lack of any black nominations in the four main categories at this year's Oscars. When it comes to the industry, that's just a glorified, magnified version of the world that we already live in. And if it's a situation whereby you don't even, you have no interest in trying to relate to the person next door to you, you're not interested in their culture, you're not interested in getting to know them, then obviously that's going to carry itself into your work in practice. Former EastEnders actress Michelle Gale thinks black women face an even tougher search for good roles. If you can think of any show with a black British female lead... I challenge you to do that because it doesn't exist. Whereas in America, you have Scandal, you have um, How to Get Away with Murder, you have um, the show with Cookie now, um, Empire, um, but there's loads. Made in Hackney, made in Newham, made in Dagenham, but above all, I was made in my mind. I was seeing it, thinking it, doing it. I used to fit tyres in Forest Gate, and now I make films in Hollywood. Thank you very much, and thanks for listening. It can be done. Idris Elba just wants these politicians to make it possible for far more children from his background. Juliet Bremner, News at 10. The lack of black actors and actresses in the Oscar nominations, which Juliet mentioned there, has led to a call for a boycott of the ceremony itself by two big Hollywood names. Over on our website, you can see who they are and read their social media postings about what they are calling the Lily White Oscars. In all the many millions of poignant stories of the First World War, few match that of Jack Kipling, son of the famous poet Rudyard. Like so many others, it is one of duty and sacrifice. Unlike many others, Jack only made it to the trenches as a result of the influence wielded by his famous father. After Jack's death, Rudyard wielded that same influence to try and locate his son, but to no avail. The exact location of his body has remained something of a mystery until today. His father once wrote that if you can keep ahead when all around you are losing theirs, then you will be a man, my son. But quite what Jack Kipling thought of this as he prepared to go over the top can only be a matter of speculation. Jack Kipling's story was made into a film for ITV some years ago, and it was as sad as any can be, because he should never have been there. His eyesight was simply too poor. His father had moved heaven and earth to get him enlisted using all his fame and connections. But according to his comrades, Jack Kipling died whilst looking for his glasses out in no man's land.
Kipling and his wife tried to find Jack's body. There have been confident assertions as to where he lay. A headstone had even been put up. But now a researcher claims to be absolutely sure after clearing up some confusion over the maps of the time. That then connects with a sergeant's witness statement who said, I carried John, who was wounded in the head, I carried him and I placed him on the left edge of the wood and I left him in a shell hole there because I believed he was dead. Roger Kipling never got over his son's death. He wrote a poem simply entitled My Boy Jack. Have you news of my boy Jack? Not this tide. When do you think that he'll come back? Not with this wind blowing and this tide. Then hold your head up all the more, this tide and every tide, because he was the son you bore and gave to that wind blowing and that tide. And that is just about all the news of the day, known as Blue Monday. Supposedly the most depressing day of the year because of the weather, post-Christmas debts and the time until the next holiday. Can't say that we've noticed here, obviously. But bear in mind this, it could have been worse. Today was certainly depressing for those in charge of the SpaceX reusable rocket project. We've reported before its successful landings, but this latest one on a barge off the Californian coast did not go according to plan. A case of rapid, unscheduled disassembly, to use the company's jargon. Not a good day at the office. Before we go, a look ahead to what might be making some of tomorrow's headlines. Mark Carney, the Governor of the Bank of England, will be making a speech around lunchtime with his assessment of the economy and perhaps more hints about interest rates again. Lower Chinese growth will be one of the factors in his calculations. And MI5 will be getting a special award, but in true espionage style, what the award is, remain or for, remains secret uh, until midnight tonight. Inevitably, that is it for tonight. I will be here uh, again tomorrow, same time. Please join me then. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching.